What's up gang, this is the Axiom Futurette channel. I'm Chris and I have a TGIX review for you today and it's gonna be 1972's The Victim which was directed by Herschel Daughtry starring the beautiful Elizabeth Montgomery. You might know this lady as Samantha from Bewitched which is what I knew her from. I think this was her first um, foray into acting uh, after Bewitched ended. So that is pretty interesting. Once again, Kino is busting out the slip treatment for this release. Very awesome. They sent this to me courtesy for review. So I'm going to get on into it. No spoilers, but here we go. Brief plot synopsis. So this story starts with um, Elizabeth Montgomery is our leading lady, but it starts with her sister. We later learn it to be her sister. Just Walton is the actress's name. She plays Susan Chapel. So um, we see her coming home to this like really big state. It looks like they have like a really nice um, like car barn and then they have um, just a beautiful looking house. So she's taking a bag of groceries. I don't know if she used uh, an old can opener. It sure looked like a screwdriver to me, but she punches some holes in this can of milk and then gives it to her cat. I don't know, I'm not really supposed to give cats milk, but I, I guess it was the 70s, so people were nuts. I note this because she opens the milk and then it like splashes all over the floor and on the cat's head and they just like leave it in. I'm like, eh, screw it, it's just a cat. We get an introduction to Kate's kitchen and um, I was in love with this house. It was very beautifully decorated in like a 70s, um, I wouldn't say like mid-century modern, but you know, a little bit after that in the 70s with like your, uh, Keller palette from that era. Very, very beautiful. So after we're introduced to that beautiful setting, which is where most of the movie takes place, we're introduced to um, Kate Elizabeth Montgomery. So we're introduced to her character from this beautiful pan. It pans over the city of San Francisco and then we see the back of Elizabeth Montgomery's head and she like turns around and she's like in this beautiful house. You just know that she's like well off because of where her house is located and how it's decorated and how she's dressed and the fact that she has a butler that fetches her car for her. So she turns around on her balcony and rings up her sister. So she calls, um, she calls Susan and is like checking on her and there are a lot of phone calls in this movie. So um, through the first one, we learn that they're sisters and we learn that Susan is planning on leaving her husband and uh, you know, she doesn't want to screw him over. She just wants to have a clean split and uh, she doesn't want to take the house or anything. She just wants it to be like they were before they were married, like, you know, just totally dissolve and, you know, what's yours is yours, what's mine's mine. Throughout the conversation, we learned that Susan is going to be alone that night because her estranged husband, Ben, is out of town on business. So, um, you know, Kate offers to Susan, hey, do you want me to go be there with you? And she's like, no, no, no. Do you want to come stay here with me? And Susan's like, no, you know, I'm fine. I'm, I got to take care of the animals, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's cool. And I don't want you driving in the big storm that's happening tonight. So, you know, we know that Ben's out of town and we know that there's a terrible storm that's, that's predicted. And that's pretty much it. Susan's like, I'm going to be cool. I'm going to cry and we'll be good. And um, after they get off the phone, Kate has like a big sister's intuition and is like, okay, I'm going to go out there even though she told me not to. So while they're on the phone and after, there's this really cool POV shot where you know, you know, kind of like Halloween, you know that somebody is watching Susan. And then she gets off the phone and she's like, what are you doing here? funny because it's like very very similar if you've seen session nine that's like the exact same scene and everything that happens in uh session nine what are you doing here so kate with her big sister's intuition senses like oh, i'm just gonna go check on my sister anyway even though she told me not to i know she's gonna be there alone so she's traveling and just like mid way she stops for gas and at the gas station she goes into the payphone because it's 1972 and um while she's there, there's just so many phone calls in this. Like, hmm, I think I'm gonna ring this person up. And I mean, it's good because like it gives us like information and it advances the plot, but it's just like at the same time, it's like this is the perfect cover for this because that is a majority of the movie is <laughs> seeing her on the phone. So Kate tries to call Susan in the payphone 
she doesn't answer and I think it may actually be off the hook or something or busy. That's actually why she like decided to go in the first place. She tried to call back later to check on her. She couldn't reach her. It was busy a couple times. Decides to drive out while she's driving. It's busy. Um, it was just pretty interesting how they advanced it that way. While she's filling up her gas, there's a cop that's like, oh, road's out a few miles up the road. So, you know, something, landslide or trees or whatever. But it was past the house, so she's able to get to her sister's house, but we know that the storm is like bad enough that they're closing down roads nearby. When Kate gets to Susan's house, it's very, there's a lot of weird things that happen. Like, even though this is a made for TV movie, there was like, the set design was absolutely beautiful and they paid a lot of attention to detail with the storm because there's buckets of water coming down. So it was kind of weird because, because Kate gets out of her car and instead of like getting in the house, because it's a torrential downpour, she takes her luggage out without being let in the house, not knowing where her sister is. Susan did shut the car barn door whenever she um, went into the house. So we don't see that her car is in there yet. So Kate gets there and is like looking around, looking around, blah, 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 like can't find a way into the house. And then I guess she finally does, but it was just very bizarre. She like left her luggage out in the pouring rain and then proceeded on into the house. So, um, and then like a couple scenes later, she went back out to get it. And I'm like, I would have brought my stuff in like a long time ago instead of leaving it out in the rain or left it in the car where it was dry. Weird like movie things, I don't know. Just things like that stick out and I'm like, the heck are you doing? That looks like nice luggage. So Kate wanders around the house for a long time and then we stumble upon the housekeeper. The housekeeper is Mrs. Hawks. She's played by Eileen Heckert, who was in Burnt Offerings. Uh, that's what I know her from. And uh, she plays a housekeeper that is kind of hard of hearing. I guess she has like a Walkman looking hearing aid from back in the day. What I didn't pick up on my first time watching this was that the very beginning scene, it shows someone leaving a house, like driving away from the house in a car. And Mrs. Hawks is standing there watching them leave. You could tell that it's her because she has the hearing aid. So that was interesting. Kate was not expecting this woman to be there because Susan had told her like days earlier that Mrs. Hawks was, uh, she fired her because she didn't like her or something. I don't know uh, what the reason was, but they're like, this woman is throwing off major, major creep vibes. Like she's just like very cold and very mean and just very dutiful to her job. And it's like, when Kate says that Susan is missing, this woman could not give one care in the world. Like she just does not, does not care at all. She's like, oh, I don't know, I gotta do my job, just doing my job. And today's my day to do the upstairs. And it's like, wow, you're a bee. What's also very interesting is that they're very formal. Like Kate, you can tell that she's like upper class because she's calling the housekeeper Mrs. Hawks. Where's Mrs. Chapel? you know, calling her sister, Mrs. Chapel. Where's Mrs. Chapel? I don't know where your sister is. Like the housekeeper replies back very informally, like you or I would talk. And, uh, you know, Kate is just like an upper echelon that is very, you know, it's, it's cool how they paid that minor attention to detail. As Kate's wandering the house looking for Susan, there's a part where she goes down into the basement. I think she hears a window um, like flapping in the wind or something like hitting and we get a shot of this. I think it's like a wicker or rattan trunk or something. And we see Susan laying there inanimate. So we assume she's dead and Kate doesn't see her. It's kind of like in the foreground and she's moving around in the back of the shot. She doesn't venture to this side of the basement to see her sister in the trunk. So um, at that point, the viewer knows something that Kate doesn't know. Susan's dead. You're not gonna find her unless you go look in that trunk. So at this point, you know, it becomes more of like a suspense film because we know that Susan's dead and we know that Kate is in danger because she's in this house. We don't know who the killer is. We don't know where they are, but we know that she is in, uh, in danger looking for her sister. There's some other characters that are introduced along the way, but it's mostly um, it's mostly very focused on Kate. So there is a friend um, that phones in and talks to her, so she knows that uh, Susan is missing. 
So um, just checking like, hey, Susan didn't go to your house, did she? There are two policemen that the friend sends over to check on Kate and um, they patch up a uh, like window that a tree busted through in the, in the upstairs bedroom. I'm like, well, that's some public service right there. They're like, oh, you got any wood we can use to patch this window? I'm like, okay. And then later on, Ben Chapel, which would be Kate's uh, brother-in-law, Susan's husband, soon to be ex-husband, shows up, which is weird. Now, in the process of looking for Susan, Kate calls around to, she knows the, um, she knows where he works. She, she calls up to his secretary and is like, hey, where does he stay whenever he's out of town? So she gives the name of the hotel and she's like, oh, but by the way, he hasn't worked here in a couple weeks. So we learn that Ben is unemployed and that, um, you know, he lied about still being employed. Susan never told Kate that Ben lost his job and Susan was under the impression that he was out of town working. So why is he here and why, you know, why was Susan misled? So there's just a lot of really fishy things going on at this point. And, um, you know, there's the housekeeper, there's Ben, there's a phone wire that's cut. The phone goes out in the middle of the movie and we see the outside line is actually cut. Later on in the story, Kate, goes back down to the basement to change a fuse or something and the trunk that Susan was in is she walks by it and there is um, a handkerchief hanging out of it and she looks at it Susan's no longer in there Susan's body's gone but her handkerchief is in it so it immediately sends alarms up to Kate she realizes that she's in imminent danger and uh, there must be something nefarious going on at that point Kate realizes what we know and uh, she realizes that she is a possible victim trapped in this house because of the storm. I must say for a made for TV movie, this was really, really good. There was a lot of really good suspenseful elements to it. Um, the mystery and like the red herrings and the twists were pretty good. Um, the set was beautifully designed. Like I said, I am jealous of this house. I want to live there. And I think that if you, um, enjoy suspense or mystery films, or even like Giallo films, this had like a lot of element of Gialli, I would give this a watch. I found it very enjoyable. I like Elizabeth Montgomery, and I think that this is a great entry into her filmography. The special features on here, we have, I mentioned the newly commissioned artwork, which is gorgeous and very appropriate. There is a couple trailers for other Kino Lorber releases. And then we have the audio commentary by film historian and author Amanda Reyes, which is awesome. Um, she does a lot of commentaries for Kino Lorber films and she does a great job. Um, what I really, really liked, I did listen to the whole thing. I really enjoy Amanda's commentaries. She has a pleasant tone. She's very easy to listen to, very good pace and really awesome, um, really awesome information. I love that she commented on, she talked about some other films. She actually compared this to Night Terror with uh, Rhoda, whatever her name is, I forget. I reviewed it. My Night Terror review is on here somewhere, but uh, she, she compared this to Night Terror in that we have a strong lead lady who happened to be in television. It did remind me a lot in a lot of ways of Night Terror because, I mean, for one, it happens to take place with a television personality and there's like a giant storm, but also the fact that there is like a really strong female, um, you know, theme to it. Like the main character is a very strong woman and an unlikely strong woman. In this case, Kate is very well off. You might not think that she would be very strong in situations under pressure, um, but she turns out to be very, very cunning when she needs to be. So uh, much like much like Night Terror, so very good in uh, that comparison. If you do get this, I highly recommend that you check out Amanda's commentary, and um, she just talked a lot about women in horror and stuff like that. I thoroughly enjoyed it. There's a lot of great information in it. So that is my review. Whenever you open it up, the artwork's the same. There's our disc. And that's what we have. Kino Lorber is absolutely knocking it out of the park with their made-for-TV movies that they're releasing. This is a great entry to have, and I highly suggest it. If you have anything to say about this, let me know below. If you like Bewitched, let me know which Darren was better. Uh, we can argue about that. But a big thanks to Kino Lorber for sending this to me for review. Very killer, very killer release. 
I hope you check it out and uh, let me know if you do. Thank you for watching my review and thanks for uh, sticking around and chatting with me. I will see you next time. Bye.